Destiny, you got cut off again. Um, totally fine. That was not my best response. <laughs> well, you can see if I summarize. Um, all right. So today we're starting out with students' opinions when they hear the words Marxism, communism, or socialism. And um, Destiny started out by saying um, she was surprised because humanists do um, separate themselves from, they say that uh, there are some humanists that the subclass of humanists is Marxist, communist, socialist. But on economic, political, and social issues, they're way to the left of the other types because of their ambiguous attitude toward democracy and their acceptance of determinism. I don't want to get into that too much other than they're against um, uh, uh, Marx's critique of the private sector uh, capitalism and also the manifesto that that says you know the proletariat will take over the economy and then the the power will sort of melt away and so um that's what they're getting at that the that marxism communism socialism advocates more government control of the economy more of the government making products and things than most humanists do. Obviously, humanists want a decent amount of intervention, but they have separated. Most of them have, have not gone in that route. Um, so, uh, but Destiny said that she was surprised. She thinks humanists ought to be farther to the left because they are humanistic. They think humans have equal rights, capabilities, opportunities, potential. And so society should be organized so that they can develop their full humanity. Um, and she doesn't think it's deterministic. And um, on the one hand, economic systems do affect your consciousness, obviously, but that doesn't mean they entirely determine it. And Karl Marx wouldn't have emerged from his own society if that's true. So he was contradicting himself. Um, but uh, Destiny says that Marxism, socialism, communism are misunderstood in the US because of the Red Scare against the Russians and Chinese. Um, and, and she made a distinction between private property and personal property. And so that's a good distinction. No one's going to steal your toothbrush. Um, but there's other, you know, there's layers and layers of what the government would um, do and not do. So it's a way more subtle than the stereotypes. Is that fair, Destiny? Yeah, that was uh, better than my very meandering whatever that was. No, Destiny. <laughs> now, naughty, naughty. You're not supposed to be too self-critical. Um, all right, so that's where we're at. And now someone I know will have opinions. Aiden, go for it. Um, I am very much against communism, socialism, and Marxism for a lot of reasons. Uh, mostly just because uh, it seems to be glorified, the ideas about it, because the ideas portray it as equal for everyone. But um, in reality, it's very not equal for everyone. And it's never worked, it never will work, because it goes against um, human nature. Um, if you tell people that they will get, I don't know, if everyone's going to have the same thing and they will all work, people just won't work. They don't work, and because they have nothing to work for, because they're getting their basic needs, um, no matter what. But um, if no one's working, then eventually they won't be able to sustain everyone's needs. So then, the because there's no elites, right? But the leaders, the political leaders, end up getting everything, and then 
where all the society comes in. Okay. Okay. All right, Rasi. Hi, Dr. Peck. So in Cambodia, um, many have, might have known about the Khmer Rouge. And although it's a more like a communist regime, but the political leaders during that regime also have Marxist background. And they're kind of like their ideal principle is to follow this humanistic viewpoint where they're trying to help the people. They eliminate class. That's like their vision though, or like what they stated that they're doing. They eliminated class, eliminated um, markets, currency, everything to make sure that the well-being of the people and uh, society are well taken care of, but that's not like what's happening and that's not true. Although that's their plan and what they claim that they're doing, actually there's still class within the new and the old people and there's still discrimination and the lives of the people are worse off. And so I think that that example is the type of humanism that we don't want like anymore in the future. And I think that um, leaders can also learn from that regime that although you claim that you're trying to be a humanist, but the actions that you do need to also like portray that through to like, you can't just go around taking away people's fundamental rights, but claiming that you are giving more than you take away. Okay. What about, um, I know Ratana said to me that, I think you said this too, Rossi, that the current leaders are able to, to just keep on doing their stuff and centralize their power by saying, you don't want to get those communists again, right? They're terrible. Yeah. Okay, so they, this like they, they, I feel like they use it as a propaganda, and if you don't really know what's happening, you're just gonna believe it, and that's what a lot of Cambodians have fall, fallen into. It's just going through that um trap in their mind that um the fear that was induced in them during the regime. That's all that they could think of. Yeah, that's why I like Aristotle. It's justice is rule for the benefit of the world. Injustice is using your power to help your friends and harm your enemies. So um, yeah, the communists used their power in the name of Marxism, humanism to help their friends yeah. and their enemies. But the anti-Marxists, the next regime uses anti-communism to help their friends and help. Does that make sense, Rossi? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly why I like Aristotle because we focus so much on these two extremes. And, and I mean, it's the wrong, you're cutting the pie the wrong way, right? It's the same pie, but you've got this rhetoric on top of it that's just crazy. It's blinding us to what's going on. That's, that's what I think. But does that make sense to you, Rossi, given Cambodia's? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, Alexis. Hi, so um, my opinion on this is, you know, on paper, uh, communism is really a perfect plan, but you know, when applied to actual human society, um, I think it's really hard to circumvent the human greed part of human nature. Um, any times that, you know, historically we've had a communistic society, it hasn't worked out great. But I also know that we've never seen a true practice of proper Marxism. Um, okay. I, yes, exactly. Honest, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I wish I was more educated on uh, what Marxism was. I have, or is, I have read the manifesto, but it's been a while and my, you know, proper high school education on it was very sparse because of the you know polarization of an education but um most of my like economic ideas do center around socialism they are, are a mix of socialist capitalist um ideas i do think 
governments should um, provide humans their basic needs uh, to kind of counteract what Aiden was saying. There are lots of countries like the Netherlands, for example, that provide their citizens with their basic needs and their productivity output is uh, way higher than other countries whose governments don't focus on those needs and focus on putting money towards other things like the military. Um, but that's kind of my thoughts on that. Okay, so the next question you might ask yourself if you have time to explore it, a couple things. His critique of capitalism versus his idea of a solution, right? So in the manifesto, I think he's good at spotting weaknesses in capitalism, but I disagree totally with his solution. Okay, so there's that distinction. And then the next distinction is, is there something in the theory that would mean it could never be truly tried, right? That's an open question, right? Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, good, Destiny. I, I am terrible at reading chats and talking at the same time. I think my students are much better at that, but um, I think it's great that you're having the debate. And so is there something in the theory that's a flaw? And that's what I taught. That's, you know, philosophy. That's me. I care about the link between theory and practice and trying always to figure out how do you have a theory that really can hit, you know, guide the practice. And so, um, all right, uh, Samantha, what have you got? Well, I pretty much am on the same view path as Aiden. I think that communism, the idea that the workers have to revolt and it can't from the government top down, I think still leads into a path of somebody has to be in charge. And by that, somebody having to be in charge and to put together that revolt that will inherently allow for a quote unquote class distinction and allowing for there to be a rise in power a power structure. So I think that the idea that there, the equality amongst all, I think is inherently impossible. Okay. Um, and so based off of just that part of Marxism, I don't agree with it. I think every time it's been tried, it's failed miserably. And even when the idea is that, oh, we haven't tried it perfectly, we'll never be tried perfectly, we'll never, nothing will never be able to nothing will be able to be tried exactly the way that it was intended to. And I think as a system, it's not very, one, healthy for its people and the people underneath it, or two, productive for society and humanity as a whole. Nothing good necessarily comes out of that system. Um, and then back to kind of my view, I guess I would say, um, I'm very much, in a sense, a capitalist in that I, one, believe that there's a sense that monopolies and the idea that monopolies are inherently capitalist, I would go ahead and argue that natural monopolies are inherently capitalist, but unnatural monopolies are uncapitalistic in a sense that there are a lot of companies and a lot of major functions within the U.S. and other places that should not be around, but the federal government stepped in to help those companies. And you can argue that with many gas and oil companies, or even to some of the social media companies, there has been government intervention. And even with government intervention, it hasn't, then even with government intervention, the United States isn't necessarily even a capitalist system because under the kind of Austrian theory of capitalism or Austrian school of economics, the federal government stepping in in itself isn't, is basically, against capitalism in itself. So I think we already have a controlled market in the US. And so um, I think out of all of the other economic systems, I think as of now, this functions the best personally. And while I there is inequality, I think no matter under whatever system you use, there will always be inequality. You won't be able to necessarily inherently get rid of that. Um, we can see that in Europe with the socialistic countries and specifically, underneath the EU, there are issues. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my opinion. Okay, I did wanna say with um, the idea, Marx was during the industrial revolution, he thought we would have a factory economy and he thought it wouldn't be hard for people to trade off jobs. 
So you wouldn't need that hierarchy of professional specialization. Obviously that has not happened. And so Gorbachev, when he dismantled the USSR, um, he did factor that in, right? He said, okay, Marx couldn't see that far ahead from an industrial-based economy to a technologically-based, but he still did argue for a Marxist socialist um, opening up, uh, you know, it, it's funny because in China also, they call it um, socialism with a Chinese character, <laughs> which, you know, okay, they let the private sector guys in, you know, but they still call it socialism because socialism, you know, whereas in America, we would never would be capitalism with an American character, which includes healthcare or something like that. So, <laughs> so I do think that's all sort of crazy. Um, and that's again why I like the Greek view is practical wisdom is you have to make a judgment about, okay, how should we run the healthcare system? How should we run the educational system? How should we run transportation, building roads and bridges and everything has to be constantly examined and re-examined. That's the Socratic thing in order to maximize, um, um, human well-being. But the other point I just wanted to make, a factoid I found out today. Um, what about, do you think that there should be a parental leave for parents, maternal leave, paid maternal leave, six weeks for mothers of babies, right? That is socialism, like that's a social program. Um, I guess I'm not gonna, how many of you th uh, think that women should get six weeks, eight weeks paid just because they're the mother? <laughs> okay. Aiden. <laughs> okay, any more thumbs up? All right, well, I mean, the information is that the US does not have that. It has a um, healthcare, like family care thing or something. And um, Melinda Gates, and Melinda Gates, like Bill Gates is not exactly a socialist guy, but he said, she said, there's only seven countries in the world that don't have it. And the US is one of them. <laughs> So Papua New Guinea doesn't have it. You know, we're really in good company. So it is true that, that we are pretty far out there in terms of how much socialism we let into our country. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna go there too much, right? That's an individual call, right? Those are individual issues. And then you'd have to discuss each one thoroughly. But just that little factoid I thought was pretty funny. Um, and a little bit surprising. Um, Thomas, what do you think? Uh, well, so for me, uh, it kind of brings up kind of the history behind how we view communism, Marxism, and socialism in the U.S. rather than the actual meanings of the views. So, you know, it was brought up before by Destiny about how the Red Scare kind of influenced how we view, you know, socialism, Marxism, and communism as a whole. And it's very much been demonized. You know, you can make the argument rightfully so or not, whatever. But what's important is the reasons why it was being done, which was, you know, to kind of garner violence and hatred towards, you know, Russians and Chinese in order to instill patriotic, you know, productivity. When people have an enemy to be angry against and an enemy to kind of point at and say you're bad but we're good it increases productivity it makes you feel united like it helps in a sense a very twisted sense and that's what the politicians were aiming to do and we're no longer in a red scare nobody's going to get fired from their job for saying hey i believe in communist ideals but i do believe we're still in kind of an era where communism socialism marxism is against the grain and still demonized just subtly 
And I think the people that are doing it now are less politicians and more kind of, you know, large capitalists. And so really, I, I kind of think that there has been paid people that are trying to reach youth and demonize it still, just like in the Red Scare. And some of these um, groups are like the Young Americans Foundation, um, Turning Point USA are two of the biggest ones. And these people will go on college campuses and high school campuses. And these people, which are, by the way, paid by these giant oil executives, I mean, the Koch brothers, I mean, the fracking companies, these giant people that only benefit from capitalism, which, I mean, I, I'm not trying to rail against capitalism here. Well, no, it's gas and oil. It's fossil fuel capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a disgusting subsect. And they're telling these kids, you know, they're trying to influence these people to demonize not necessarily communism, you know, the idea of fully overthrowing capitalism. They're trying to demonize these social practices and these regulations that could hurt them and hurt their profit. Because when people think communism, they no longer think free health care or, you know, social services. They think we have to overthrow our government and install a dictator and everyone has to share everything. And by demonizing it that way, those politicians and those, you know, big oil capitalists are never going to be hurt by the regulations and kind of ways of keeping an eye on them and stopping them from exploiting workers and exploiting like, citizens, really. So I guess my kind of little takeaway is that we've moved away from patriotic hatred of communism. We're moving more towards like a business hatred of social services that come out of socialism. Okay. Okay, because I, I don't want to demonize all billionaires, whatever. Billionaires are really disagree with each other. So now you have um, Bill Gates trying to get us to a carbon free and uh, Warren Buffett. And then we have the Koch brothers and another group that really want fossil fuels forever. And they really do. That's all documented. So. Um, that is that is an issue, the quarrel between the billionaires. Um, but that I think, yeah, okay. And one of them demonizes socialism, but both of them, you know, prefer capitalism to socialism. So, um, yeah, I hope some of you in America know about these organizations that are coming on college campuses. I don't know if they've gotten to Lion or not, or. It would be worth, I don't know. But anyway, it's true and I read about it. And I just keep trying to do my thing, you know. Um, Haley, do you have something? Um, I think theoretically it's a good idea, but it's not something that can be worked out. I think a lot of social working would happen just doesn't provide much motivation for its citizens. Um, for capitalism, it's kind of greedy, I'll admit that, but it still provides motivation. So I'm not sure how Marxism can do that. Okay. Um, plus, what we usually have is a combination, so you could consider that, right? It just has a different starting point, but we really want to find a convergence. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And so each of you, I hope that each of you goes into some field and you look at the situation in your discipline, your profession, um, because then you'll have more sophisticated opinions. I mean, that's what I pay people for, right? Every expert should have good opinions about the mix between private and public in their profession, uh, in their life. That's how we can get up to a reasonable way of understanding it. Um, so Kasturi, I'll skip you Untari for now, but I'll get back to you. Um, Kasturi, do you have something? Uh, Professor, I, I totally disagree with the view of Marx regarding classes and equity. So I personally think that <clears throat> we can never create a society with no classes because I personally believe that uh, we human beings uh, are not same in potential and strength. We poses we pose some <clears throat> sort of uh, strength and potentials, but then uh, 
they differ from person to person, right? And <clears throat> Uh, since we human beings are not same in uh, potential strength, education, or other things, then I don't <clears throat> think that um, we will be able to uh, implement uh, the view of equity uh, at all. Because like, I know that uh, educated people uh, are aware of the... Uh, principle of equity uh, but then I don't think that uh, it can be implemented practically uh, because like <clears throat> uh, we learn so many things but then uh, it's uh, quite difficult to implement uh, theoretical things into reality right so yeah <laughs> that's what I have okay that's great um and I know you also plan on someday supporting the orphanages and things like that, right? So, I mean, you do want to give back. And so it's not like your goal in life is just to get rich, right? And so you can want a private market and just want private philanthropy, right? Or uh, another thing that, that I prefer is you start out with public-private partnerships people just work together in the private sector, in the public sector, and, and just get things done, um, I guess. And that's just another thing to consider. So does that make sense, Kasturi, that? Um... Yeah, yes, Professor. Okay. Um, Giovanni. Um, so my view on it was, so like, I know realistically speaking and I'm like I'm hearing everybody saying like it is impossible and like I don't want to say I, I disagree because it kind of is like impossible for everybody to be on the same class but from experience how, how I can put it is living here for these couple years in America and that compared to living basically all my life back in my country I would say like there's more, I would say, classes. I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like in America, there's like so much more, like in a sense, you can have like so many levels of poverty or like how extreme this can be, how that can be. And I feel like in my country, it's like more defined and like, it's either you're this or you're that, you know? And I was, for me, my, what I would want ideally is for there to be like everybody on the same level because you, can, you have four people, right? And if you're born into poverty, you're already, like, people say it's, how you say, people say it's your choice or if you want to work hard and you want to put in more effort to be rich. But sometimes you don't have a choice because if you're born into poverty, you don't have the, the money to get an education. You don't have money for, let's say, a good enough diet to be operating at 100 percent and it you're already at such a big disadvantage and that's where it comes in where i say ideally i i wish like there could be a way to make a society where everybody is born with at least a, an opportunity you know like you you have it the ability to be great from birth like that's what i i that's what i want ideally and i feel like if there was a society with no classes i feel like there's a possibility for that to happen because at the end of the day you cannot you can't force individuals to to go out there and make an effort and try but what you can do is at least make it an option for them you know like give them the chance to and that's that was my take on it okay i will say that lion college actually has a combination of a lot of stuff um they have Pell Grants, they have government funded scholarships, then they have the board is wealthy people who contribute, and then there's state. So it is a public private partnership, Lyon College is, all the liberal arts schools are, and then students pay, of course, but um, actually at Lyon, for every student we have, we, we go $10,000 in debt. <laughs> which I think is crazy, but um, 
So there is the fact that we're overspending, but there's also the students only pay a small fraction. And then some of it comes from private philanthropy, comes from the government, comes from um, a lot of different sources. So um, it is funny when our rhetoric, socialism versus capitalism, it, it doesn't fit at all our reality. And so we have this huge disconnect between the world we're actually living in and the categories we use to describe that world. Um, okay, so that that's my job as a philosopher to sort of point that out. Um, Blaine, what do you think? Hello. Um, so I don't know that much about Marxism. I kind of fall in the same boat as I'm sure, especially Americans, a lot of us. Um, I think I've really talked a lot about that. Um, the whole Bible Belt and all that. Yeah. Um, I will say, I think I'm agreeing with um, a lot of people like socialism and communism, like they look good on paper and like there's a possibility that they could, like they could work and certain aspects of them are awesome. I mean, who doesn't want everybody to like be happy and healthy? But that, I, mean, I feel like that's just a common sense kind of goal. Um, but like, uh, with human nature and greed and just the way our reality is shaped, like it just, it wouldn't work. And I, it hasn't, it's everywhere it's been tried really. Um, I think the most recent example is Venezuela. Their inflation went up like a thousand percent, literally. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, I mean, in theory, it'd be very good. Actually, and so, hmm? one thing is that all of you should go and read the Communist Manifesto because um, the thing that made communist movements powerful was the critique of capitalism, right? And so all of you are referring to what socialism looks like on paper, but that wasn't what was really driving people. What was driving them was when Marx told him about what capitalism had done to them. And then he gives the solution. So that's why I'm saying he was much better at critiquing capitalism than he was at providing a solution. And so all of you are saying, you know, the solution is bad, which is fine, I, I agree. So the way I teach it in class, I say, it's like you come to the doctor and you have the hiccups, right? And the doctor puts a plastic bag over your head and yeah, you get over the hiccups, you know? <laughs> but you die. So it's just, uh, that's what it's like. Like capitalism has hiccups, but you know, kill it. And it, you know, you kill the whole thing. So um, I would, I, I encourage you to read it. I don't, I can't assign it in this class, I don't think, but it's not a long read and it is, I teach it in environmental ethics and the students go nuts because they really understand, especially the AUW students, um, what capitalism does if it's not regulated. But Marx just advocated, you know, abolishing a lot more of it. So destiny, that's fine. You know, whatever degree of, of abolition, it's not a, it, I would say he advocated abolishing it quite a bit but it's up to you you can read it doesn't matter um so jamie do you have an opinion about marxism okay um untari do you have an opinion about marxism at this point um not really, but I think I'm agree with every, uh, with almost all of the students that it's almost impossible to have a world without classes because like at some point we need leader, we need people who to lead the economic or politics to work, right? And if everyone have the same status or same classes, I think it's not going to work, Professor. And okay. communist is sounds like a dream rather than a reality. The theory is just too good to be applied, and it's 
never working. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have a question. Sure. So like I keep hearing every uh, people saying like uh, you need somebody in power and stuff like so isn't it possible that we can still have like a regular society with like people in charge and like a regular I would say working system but just everybody still be on the same like I would say economic class like is that like impossible? Yes. I don't think so like because when people have a power i think they will change they will feel the power and they have those power they will try to i don't know power make people power corrupts was yeah what? okay well that was a big thing in the u.s that's why we had this checks and balances i think uh professor it's also because human beings are ambitious, right? So they aim for a certain thing and uh, when they reach uh, at a certain point, then they, they forgot uh, the background they came from. They <clears throat> just, they just think of uh, the things that they have at present. So uh, it's basically, uh, it is the fact that, uh, uh, when people um, people get authority of something, then uh, they will uh, they most of them will misuse it. So, yeah. Okay. So again, I want to point out to you that you go to a liberal arts college, and actually, the whole foundation for the thing is nothing. It's not capitalism or socialism, right? It's none of those. It was Greek. Humanism, okay, why? Because you were supposed to learn about the arts from artists. You were supposed to learn about all these different things from people who really had chosen not to make money, right? So just because capitalism um, does allow for greed, our founders never wanted people to be primarily motivated by greed. Do you remember that? way back in that virtue of an educated voter, they're really worried about that all anybody cares about is money. And then they're, gonna, they're not gonna be educated enough to avoid getting manipulated by politicians who tell them, you know, if you vote for me, you can get rich. Um, and that, do you remember when I, I can go back to that article, but I mean, the main point was at that time, the founding, they were worried that people would not pay taxes for a decent educational system. And if you don't have a decent educational system, you're going to have voters who get manipulated and you're going to lose your democracy. So one of the main foundations for maintaining a democracy is that people aren't so greedy that they aren't willing to pay taxes for education. In other words, the system has to focus on a free market, but it also has to include willingness to pay taxes for collective social goods. And he said, you know, that education, even in the 50s, it was considered a social good. People who had college had, were healthier, they were more productive, all this stuff. So that's that's what I why I keep pointing out that it's in between and Lion College and AUW hey you guys incidentally <laughs> we're not educating you just so you can go take that piece of paper and get stinking rich and never look back eh, okay <laughs> we're educating you so that you find your sense of calling what you can do to, what is it that satisfies you that the society needs? So if you wanna be a teacher, you're not gonna make as much money, but you do it because you think education is important for developing people and for developing a society, or you wanna be an artist, or you wanna be a psychologist, or you wanna be a, you know, you wanna start a 
nonprofit. I mean, there's a zillion things to do that aren't primarily money, right? And if everybody only got this piece of paper to go get rich, we would lose our democracy. It was not founded for that reason. Um, so I hope people understand that. I don't know, does any, so, okay. So just because you have a private market doesn't mean you tell your kids, I want you to get the job that makes the most money to make me look good, or that's the American dream. And if whatever, by whatever means necessary, right? No, obviously, I think you can understand that that's not gonna go, that's gonna go south pretty fast. Uh, but I, you know, I honestly don't, when I say this to students, it's like, it hadn't been articulated to them that way before, even though it's exactly what's going on. And that's kind of scary because there's been some extremely powerful rhetoric. You're getting brainwashed by the culture without anybody sort of explicitly even being aware of it. It's just the way people talk about stuff is making us blind to what actually is there, but we could lose it. So that's kind of uh, what I'm getting at. And also, I think I'm just gonna have to move on for a second, but I think keep taking notes so that when you do get in breakout rooms, um, I think I will put you in breakout rooms. And I think what I'll do is have you pick your top you know, you'll have round one, the top thing you want to talk about to other students. And then you have round two or whatever until the time runs out. But um, I did want to, um, to talk about, all right, so here was my list of things because next time I want you to pick Next time you pick your favorite kind of humanism and you give a formal presentation, that's for next time. Um, here's examples of some of the kinds of, excuse me, humanism. Um, and you present, you have the, and I did ask you to do PowerPoints just because I think you're gonna to have to do it the rest of your life. So you might as well start. Um, and they don't have to be complicated. Just one, you don't have to have those little graphics or anything, just your main point and then the points that are going to support it. Um, all right, so here's what, I do have some readings that I attached, I have, one that has humanistic psychology. If you want that to be your article, that's okay. I have one on Christian humanism that's plenty long. If you want that to be yours, if you want to take that one and present it. Um, but these are other ones the students found, which I think are fascinating. And again, the students at AUW would be humanism and Buddhism, humanism and Islam, or humanism and medicine in Bangladesh, or you know any sort of thing you can just punch in on your machine and see what you come up with. Um, let's see, environmentalism, that's big. Public policy, um, polytheism, technology, humanism and communism, if somebody wants to go find an essay about that. Um, humanism and original sin. Um, medicine, there are doctors who consider themselves humanist. Probably um, Newland, that um, person we interviewed, the person Krista Tippett interviewed, who talked about the biology of the spirit, he would probably call himself a humanist doctor. Um, humanism and feminism. Uh, there's Afri actually African American humanist organization. In, in the US, there's tons of organizations. And I also think the internet 
has drawn people in all the developing countries. They have all sorts of friend groups on Facebook or whatever. Um, so there's you're going to have lots of stuff that you can appeal to. Um, so the material for today was um, I tried to present in my country. There's a lot of polarizing going on. Um, let's see. I wanted. Yeah, here. Let me see how I could start it. Um, OK, let me start with the Declaration of Independence. Just FYI, um, for Americans, um, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, all right? That is straight out of Descartes. He had self-evident truths. He was an Enlightenment rationalist. He rejected the Aristotelian. And these guys know this. This is a huge cultural button that they just punched. They're telling the world, we are enlightenment, progressive uh, thinkers, okay? Self-evident. And then equality, this is enlightenment. And so, you know, to refer to the creator, to use the word God, well, they were deists and theists, but they were not using the word the way that any sort of traditionalist or conservative used it. And the people at the time knew that. Um, and then the whole idea that no leader has a right, right? That people have to, it's a constitutional government. Again, extremely radical, way out there. Um, and they're rejecting the divine right of kings. They're rejecting that the king speaks for God, which was in theory, you know, the divine right of kings. Um, all right, the other thing that I want to point out is that they're trying to have a principled revolution. This isn't just a power struggle, it's based on principles. And um, they define tyranny as, um, okay, so a ruler only rules for the sake of the ruled. And so the ruler has no right to use his power to harm the ruled. And when a ruler abuses his power, he's called a tyrant. So they start out with that. And then this is the key. The history of the present King of England is a history of abuses of power. So they're going to prove that their, their revolution is legitimate. Then they use scientific method, empiricism. Number one, he did this. Number two, he did this. Number three, he did this. And again, that's completely a signal that we are going to follow scientific method. We are going to be progressive. We are going to be the new paradigm for how you should use power. Um, so, so they would have been called definitely Christian humanists, okay? They would have been called enlightenment humanists, but they also really liked Aristotle's virtues. And they also liked Confucius Analects, which they were so progressive. They just didn't care who said it, as long as it's true. Um, so they really cared about the virtues. Um, all right, so, so on the one hand, after 9-11, and so I think a lot of you pointed to the Red Scare, which of course I grew up with the Red Scare, and my parents rejected that kind of demonizing, but I remember when the wall came down, my oldest child was in third grade, and I thought, she's never going to live with that, you know, she's not going to have that. When people said, people told me your dad is almost a communist, you know, because he disagreed, you know, he was in favor of the civil rights movement. You were a communist. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, yes, I was in the middle of that. But that got brought back after 9-11, okay? So there were people who blamed the pagans, the abortionists, the feminists, the gays, and God allowed this to happen because our country was being destroyed by these people. 
and they they demonized the people who founded our country, Episcopalians. Eighty five of them were the the signers of, I think, the Constitution. I mean, the vast majority. And then they demonize all the ones that unite reason and faith. Okay, and then socialism comes back. So I don't know if the rest of you know that, but socialism got you know the the humanists, the socialists, the pagans, the feminists, the gays. So that was part of the the um, we you know demonizing. So socialism became a, another big demon again, and pro capitalism was Christian. Christian capital, blah, blah. Okay, anti-family, um, unpatriotic, blah, 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 blah. Okay, our goal is a Christian nation. We're called by God to conquer. Okay, uh, we don't want pluralism. So that's important to know about the US. Um, again, the other countries, I think, I mean, I, I hope that the rest of you, like Rossi says about um, Cambodia, they also wrestled with those questions. I know that Indonesia wrestled with, on the one hand, secular, a secular government, on the other hand, Marxism, and they came up with Panchasila. Um, so all the developing countries are dealing with things like that. India has a very progressive constitution, but each child is born into a religion and they are also subject to religious laws, except that they can't contradict the um, federal laws. Let's see. Um, oh, here's the manifesto, the 2000, man whoops. I went back to the virtues so you can look back and see to what extent you think um, the humanism fits with the classical virtues. Um, but here's the, this, these are more something again to think about. Obviously it makes sense. They want to expand to be the planet, planetary humanism. And they start out with um, the past, right? The heritage goes back to Greece and Rome, China, and we will read the Analects and the movement in India. So we will look at the, the humanist branches in India. Um, okay. Then prospects for a better future, scientific naturalism. Um, okay, and then they... Um, Let's see, most worldviews accepted today are spiritual, mystical, theological. They have their origins in ancient pre-urban nomadic agricultural societies, and they're very backward, right? So, okay, on the one hand, they say, no, we have our roots in all these. And then on the other hand, they say, no, we don't. So like you can, you're part of the conversation. You just decide what you think of all of that. And then they talk about ethics, universal commitment. This is more in line with the United Nations. And it also is worried about um, climate change. That's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Humanists are very much um, emphasizing that. Let's see. So that's, that's the next wave, the way that humanism um, comes out with these manifestos. I was looking for a more recent one. I'm sure there is a more recent one, but somehow I couldn't find it on my machine. Okay, so now I'm going to go into polarization. So I'm gonna go, yeah, I did one. This document is polarizing on the right. And this one is, is showing the problem of hypocrisy. Then this one is the polarization on the left. And this one is polarization on the left. So um, I'm trying to be fair. So hold on to your horses if you think I'm only attacking from one side, because I think personally, this is horrible and it's ruining everything. Um, so I wanna make sure I convey that. Then the, the students at AUW have to figure out how is this happening in my country? Because I think it is happening in your countries. And I think 
a lot of leaders, leaders in Brazil, the leader of Brazil was going right, just imitating Trump step by step, you know? And a lot of leaders were imitating George W. Bush step by step. I knew that because I used to follow, I followed it, right? Um, so, so that's what I'm curious to know about the students in these countries, do you know? So this is a thing about Jerry Falwell. All right, I, let me just give you an example of how I think I'm even keel on this. When 9-11 happened, okay? It was at 9.30 in the morning or something. And I had classes at like, Anyway, I walked into class. I think I had 11 o'clock class or something. Maybe it was the next day. Oh yeah, it happened on a Tuesday and I didn't have my morning class till Wednesday. Okay, so a student said, Dr. Beck, you're not gonna like what Jerry Falwell said. <laughs> and uh, she showed me this news article. And I said, you know, I understand that. Um, I know why he said that because he went to college and his parents paid good money for him to go to college. And he had to take a philosophy class. And the teacher, the first day of class said, I'm gonna beat the religion out of you. And it's just, of course, you're gonna get people reacting against that because it's wrong. It's illiberal, right? It's just, it's so ignorant for one thing because the person is assuming that all religion is anti-reason, which my God, don't they know about the history of our country? So that I understood that. And I even knew there was going to be a backlash if that happens a lot. I know I, the people in my profession, I know that they would cause a backlash. I know what they're doing. I know what they're saying, right? They hate religion. One of them was an obsessive moral relativist. One of them was a great believer in sleeping around and you know, <laughs> having a lot of sexual partners in principle and you know all this stuff that you're going to get a reaction. And sure enough, 9-11, uh, polit their political rhetoric took advantage of all that that was going on. Well, then Jerry Falwell Jr. turns out to be corrupt. He's, he's totally motivated by sex and money, by pleasure. And that Jerry Falwell Sr. created Liberty University, tons of money, it's huge. But his son came on board and basically they were people were complaining before this happened that he just hired all of his buddies to build these huge buildings and all the money coming in to support Liberty University, he was just shelling out to his buddy, right? He was helping his friends. And um, so anyway, and then he got caught uh, doing sex stuff and all sorts of other stuff, which is sad, right? I mean, Jerry Falwell Sr. would be unhappy about this, but these things happen. Um, also, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, is on the board of Liberty University, and he is not, he is a very mean-spirited person, and he's extremely anti-Muslim. His father was not mean-spirited like that. He's into power. Just, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting, because it goes back to the three choices in life, which is pleasure, money, power, and glory or um, wisdom and justice. And so Jerry Falwell, you know, he, I think honestly he had really good intentions, but I think um, other people who have more, uh, aren't as well-intentioned and aren't as mature, get a hold of it and corrupt it and use it more to demonize liberals than to actually create a nice Christian atmosphere. But the girl at the end, the article I have at the end is about a girl who, um, who you know, thought it was really what Jerry Fallon taught me. She's going on in, um, you know, a conservative, um, she hasn't lost her faith, right? She just feels like she witnessed somebody 
who the Bible says, you know, people are corrupted by power. So, um, so anyway, I am tried to be even handed about that. Um, and then on the other side, this is really a problem, is that educated people have a terrible prejudice against um, less educated people. And I, I've witnessed that a lot, and I think it's horrible. Um, I taught that, um, Aiden knows, I taught that in my year one class about the corruption of Berkeley and the big elite universities. There's just a lot of corruption among the intellectually elite and this disdain for working class people. And um, so one of the reasons that I, well, I was taught my dad was a preacher and he was a Methodist preacher, which is all about empathy. It's not so much about orthodoxy, but um, I, the other thing, the real way that I can empathize with people, which is what I always think about when I go to Walmart or I go to places where I know if they knew what I thought, they would not like me, but that's okay. I understand why they wouldn't, but I still like them, right? Because what I remember was I had children, having children instantly to me, that's empathy. Because in a what uh, oxytocin is the emotion that drives me. That's it. I don't care about other stuff. So that right there, I get that. They all have kids. They all care about their kids. The other thing is, when I got pregnant the third time, neither one of us had a job. So I also have some empathy <laughs> with not knowing, you know, where the next meal is coming from. But that separates me. You know, I I don't like. Uh, intellectual elitism. I went to a really high rank school. And after two years, I quit because I thought this school, people are really snobby, and they're corrupted. If, if I get this piece of paper from this school, I'm going to spend the rest of my life thinking, I know more than I know. I hadn't even read Plato yet by then, right? I thought that that degree would make me arrogant. And I didn't want it. So, um, but I, so that's all I'm saying is I really do understand this and I really hold these people accountable because they should be smarter than that. And, um, and then the other one is philosophy as blood sport that um, even among philosophers, they absolutely trash each other on these sites. I don't go to any of these sites, but this woman, is just citing how cruel and heartless people are, even among people in their own profession. So, um, so the academy is training people to be attack dogs, you know. And I used to read editorials, um, and I had to stop reading them. I'm not even going to say who wrote them, because again, that would not be good, you know. Um, I would pick out seven logical fallacies in an editorial. And I just stopped because I mean, this isn't doing me any good. Um, I like logic because it helps me think through my stuff. But I, and, you know, when I talk to another person, um, I like to be like Socrates. I mean, I just like to start out where they're at and um, try to help them work through. And we're not going to have a democracy unless we do that, unless we start learning how to be honest with each other about what we think, and then start examining ourselves and each other. And just, just the example of the fact that the language that so many of you are given to understand your world doesn't correspond at all to what is actually in front of your face which is why I teach philosophy, because ideas really matter. Um, let's see, then here's the Christian humanism post, but for the AUW students, you would just find Muslim humanism, you know? And I hope it's okay that I didn't look for all that because we are gonna do Buddhism, Hinduism, and 
Confucianism and Islam later on. Um, but feel free to go go find it. This one is the one about uh, Adam Smith knew that if we had a free market, he was the one who wanted to get rid of mercantilism, the way the aristocratic class controlled the market. He wanted to open up the markets, but he also, it was very important to him to teach people to be generous because he knew that if people are greedy, this is not gonna work and money is gonna stick to money. Um, okay. And John Locke was also a, a um, counselor to the US founding fathers. And he lost all of his property because of course he was the counselor to, to uh, traitors, right? The people who declared war on Britain. So he's, you know, John Locke's gonna get in trouble because he's a traitor. Um, and so there is this, this uh, mindset of freedom, you know, everybody is an individual and they have the right to this and that and that. Um, but the trouble is um, with the right in economic life, this is like the Achilles heel of the system. John Locke only wanted a barter system. He did not want money because he knew right away, then the rich money will stick to money and they can lord it over the poor and that, that there'll be a huge class split. Locke wanted a middle class. And so the way he set up a minimal government system, he's, you know, it's a minimal government. It's keep the government out of my life, but that was a barter system. <laughs> That's not what we have today, folks. Um, and so, Adam Smith said, it's, you know, ideally, so here's the thing about idealizing capitalism, right? Yeah, it should be that you work, you get paid according to the value of your work. It doesn't happen when money starts sticking to money, it's trouble. Uh, the landlord uh, demands rent, they can give you loans. Um, Okay, so they can stop, they can force workers to do stuff that isn't, you know, they can control the market. It's not a free market. So it's the Achilles heel of a minimal government. Unequal wealth leads to unequal rights. You can't get a, as good a lawyer as a rich person can. You can't start a magazine, a newspaper, as much as many or with as, you know, much reach. Now, again, with the Facebook and stuff, it's helped in that sense, but there's other problems. Um, the legislators paying for political campaigns, all these things. So that doesn't mean you're going to reject capitalism. It just means you have to critique it. And pe the people way at the beginning were Adam Smith was very concerned that people learn to be generous and to give money intelligently. That could be private, public, whatever. If you think way, our founders way back wanted taxes for education. So it's never been the only reason for taxes is military and police. It's never been like that. And our founders knew that and they wanted um, something more than that, especially education. Um, all right, so, and then John Locke wanted a barter system so that then you could have a middle class. And I, I think that's true, but that's not what we have. So let's get over it and figure out how to adapt or how to have a case law history where we're actually changing according to the changes of the times. We can't just keep going back to original tent, intent and original um, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So what I wanted to do next time, you're going to pick your own humanism and then you have this paper on your second paper is due out the 29th, the 30th, right then 
after the next class. And then we'll be done with the material. So let me, you know, have you sort of run through all the ideas in your head of the possible things, because you can make up your own thesis. I have a few things, but, um, you know, it's better if you create something that you really, that you're really invested in. This is what I really want to say. It's also better if you just decide, I'm going to write this paper on what I want to say. Now I have to figure out what I want to say. But some students don't want to do that. They want a uh, prompt, right? They want me to write something and then they can react. So that's fine, whatever. But here's the uh, virtue of an educated citizen. And if you remember, in a democracy, citizens have to be educated to be self-controlled, generous, and have these virtues. That's what, that's not pie in the sky. If people are just greedy, that's how Athens lost its democracy. So there has to be this balancing. Um, I just, yeah. All right, so here's the quote where he says, no one creed seems able to encompass the backgrounds. Um, we need to revive the founder's definition of education as an ascent, uh, public good. We should also recover the concept of virtue, classically defined as a core public virtue. Well, I mean, there is one creed that is capable. It's Aristotle's virtue. So I don't know what his problem is. But anyway, if you wanted to go back to that and think about it, maybe include it in your paper. Then we had the thing about Aristotle's virtues and management. Um, if you wanted to um, do a paper on that, that's one of the paper topics. Then the change agents, okay? If you want to write uh, about a humanist change agent, or the interesting things here is that um, David Brooks disagrees with some aspects of Bill Drayton and his social entrepreneur, right? He agrees with some of it and disagrees with some of it. But the main thing, the, his thing is cognitive empathy-based living for the good of all, right? That sounds like what we're working on. Um, um, so what I think, again, all of you, as students at a liberal arts college, you should be able to be really good at this because you've studied lots of different disciplines. That's sort of the point about how this kind of education can be valuable at this point in history. Um, you have to be able to think outside the box. You can't, um, you, okay. The central challenge is to make everyone a change maker. Um, let's see, all right. Yeah, okay. And then um, David Brooks questioned some of it and whatever. Again, you're in the debate, you can decide whatever you think. Um, then the next one was um, the uh, Martin Luther King, these old themes from Martin Luther King's organized religion. So it would be the difference between humanistic religion and um, religion as a social club versus religion as social justice versus religion as um, conservative like Jerry Falwell, right? So religion can be a conservative influence or progressive influence. Um, he was labeled, right? What you get labeled. You have to stop worrying about whether you're gonna get labeled <laughs> socialist or capitalist or whatever. Just try to work out your position um, and unite reason and faith or unite reason with whatever you think flourishing is. And if you wanna be a raving atheist, you can be a raving atheist, I don't care. Um, as long as you're articulate, you give me your reasons. Uh, then we have the Sermon on the Mount and um, Socrates and Jesus, if you remember, those are the classical virtues. Then we had the humanism of John Stuart Mill. 
And the key there is that he used the, um, the tools of empiricist science. So, you know, he's starting with facts in order to prove that we should create this society that's totally different from anything you've ever experienced. How do you do that, right? How do you do that? But he did it. That's why it's such a, a work of genius, I think. Uh, because we can know for a fact that why do people resist it? Well, it's based on emotions. You know, you know that. I ask, you know, everybody is just emotions. There's a gap between what's emotions and what's reasonable. All these things basically are facts. But it's, you know, it's, you're arguing from facts to argue for this incredible change. And as a change agent, right? That's what you yourself should be thinking of doing, right? Based on the facts, what sort of vision do I have, you know, for a, a society moving forward? Whatever it is, you know, you want to do for a good manager or a good political leader, it's not just ruling for the sake of the rule. It's just what exactly does that mean in our time, right? What does it mean for climate change? What does it mean for race issues? What does it mean for international uh, relations to other nations? What is it? Then there's the gay and the race. There's all of that. Um, and then if you want to write your paper on humanism versus anti-humanism, um, is this a problem? I think it's a problem, right? It's just causing people to get so fixated on something that is not the main issue. And so, yeah, having people come to college campuses. So college campuses in general have all these raving liberal professors. And so these conservatives are gonna come in paid for by the fossil fuel billionaires and they're going to fix things so it's free and balanced, right? So the culture wars are being played out. And if you want to read, write a paper saying the culture wars are a huge distraction from what my generation really has to cope with. So you could write a paper about that. Um, you could write about the demonizing of either socialism or capitalism is a huge distraction from what we really need to be doing. You can write a paper on that. Um, okay, so I think I have talked too long. Um, oh, let me just put you into groups for a second anyway, and somebody can get started and somebody can tr see it. I'll, I'll try to put you in two groups and just go ahead and have your lightning round of what you wanna chip in, what you wanna say. And you can let me know next time if you wanna start with more conversation about this, okay? Um, because I sort of uh, blew it on that. So there you go, just do your lightning round, okay? Change to one because the way nope, I gotta put a um, I'm gonna move Thomas to the green team. Um, Jamie, are you there? Oops, I'm gonna pause. Okay. So this is why I do, um, I, I've been honored to be able to be a professor of philosophy at a liberal arts, a small liberal arts school. Like it was my dream job and I'm glad I got it. It was hard because I think I failed um, because the country has gone the other way but that's okay. I mean, every generation has to pick up and try. 
But um, for lion, it had these five characteristics, which is when you're asking, you know, about socialism, communism, if you're asking about humanism, anti-humanism, if, you know, in order to avoid polarization, which leads to authoritarianism every time, okay, you have commitment to truth. There is truth. Human, you know, women are just as capable as men. People of other races are just as capable people who are different sexually are just as capable. It's truth. It's based on science. Um, so commitment to truth, um, intellectual honesty, don't claim to know what you don't know. So if you're a philosopher and you decide all religion is anti-intellectual, you're claiming to know you don't know serious things about the United States that you don't know. Um, uh, fairness to opposing points of view. Every philosopher should do that, and they don't. They they treat their training like a blood sport. Ah, now I have this weapon that I can go after people with. It's terrible. Anyway, fairness points of view, patience with complexity and ambiguity, and tolerance of reasoned dissent. Reasoned dissent. If someone comes and tells me, you know, I know you're horrible because blah, blah, and they don't give any reasons. Of course, I tolerate because I'm a, in a position of authority, but you can't just tolerate it. And there, there is a drive to come into college campuses and use the claim of free speech in order to destroy it, right? You come to a college campus and you start demonizing and polarizing and then if somebody says, you can't say that on campus, oh, that's censorship. There is a plan to do that. So Lyon says you tolerate reasoned dissent. Um, one time I lived on campus and the Baptists wanted to use my living room as their meeting point, which fine, you know, I fed them cookies and, and the woman sits there right in front of me and says, these liberals are terrible. You should never tolerate them. <laughs> like, I'm sitting there and it's in Lion College, you know, but okay, you know, life goes on. I couldn't make a stink. I didn't feel like making a stink out of it. Um, but there, you know, there are groups that come onto Lion Campus that are not liberal. They don't follow the foundation, but uh, the school is pretty generous about it. Um, all right, so, so take care and I will see you and I look forward. Next time you have to present, you have to give an official presentation. So good luck.